Uh, this is our August 2024 edition. Uh, it's going to be a little bit short, so good news, bad news, depending on how you take it. Uh, it'll just be uh, Brian and Tim uh, providing uh, insights today. Uh, with that, we'll just go ahead and kick it over to Brian. All right. So today's uh, talk, uh, I wasn't I wasn't on the last uh, webinar last last month. So some stuff has happened, and there's been a lot in the news about recession fears and um, what inflation is, what's going on with the inflation uh, situation, as well as unemployment numbers. And, you know, I saw headlines discussing emergency rate cuts and everything else. But what you notice about some of the, a lot of those comments, they're not actually, they're not coming from the Federal Reserve. Those are coming from folks with a very different set of uh, responsibilities or concerns than what the Federal Reserve is concerned about. And I read a an article that the headline said, it's not the Federal Reserve's job, well, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's not the Federal Reserve's job to make the stock market feel comfortable. And and that's, that's true. And that's something that I think gets overlooked a lot of times uh, when you see, you know, stocks dip 2% in one day because of a report that comes out, the, the Federal Reserve's main objectives is stable employment, stable prices, uh, things like that, uh, stable growth path, and not necessarily avoiding volatility in the stock market. So I, I want you to keep that in mind as I go through this. And so the most recent uh, inflationary numbers came out yesterday. And the, that's that's for July of 2024 is the is the most recent month that we have inflation data for. Again, it we it's a, it's a look back uh, to what to what had happened previously, and this is the chart coming through. And I put this green line in here to show what the Federal Reserve's target inflation rate is, which is two percent, as they've stated many times. And as of July, um, this most recent July of 2024. Headline inflation, which includes all items in the CPI, is down to about 2.9%. Okay, so it's it's really been just kind of ranging there from about 3.2 to 2.9%, 3.3 to 2. You can see the last you know year or so, it's really just been bounded by this. I know 2.9 is the one of the lower readings we've had in quite a while, but it's really just been kind of moving up and down uh, between a couple of percentage points for the for more more than a year, really. And so while that number 2.9% is a lot better than, say, jumping up to 3.7 or 4, it's still it's still worth bearing in mind that it's not it, it, it isn't at that 2% target yet. It's still quite a ways away, especially when you consider that most of the movements of it have been in a tenth of a percentage point a month. Uh, this period, it's it's been very, very sticky and slow to, to adjust even further, given what how long interest rates have been where they're at. And there's a, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to continue to take a while to get this number down to where the Federal Reserve would like to see it, which is, again, that 2% mark. Here's the core inflation number, slightly different chart uh, setup because of how I had to get the information. Core inflation targets also at 2%, which is this line, um, the, the very first line up that you see. And core inflation came out uh, at about 3.2% for, for July. So again, it's it's been trending in the right direction, but at a, at a fairly slow pace. You know, we're talking about one, two tenths of a percent uh, per month uh, that, that this has been declining, which is again... We're headed in the right direction, but it's taking a long time to get there. You know, it's one of those things where the closer you get to your objective, and, and I gave an example of this, and I think folks will kind of understand the analogy that, you know, when you're in school, uh, the amount of hours you have to study for a, a test to get a B on the test is very different than the amount of hours you have to study to get an A. So the closer, the closer, uh, the, the closer you try to get to perfection, you know, the amount of time it takes to get there maybe doubles, triples, quadruples, and that, and that's kind of what we're seeing here. The closer you get to that 2% mark, the longer it's going to take. And the, and, and that's, that's just kind of the way it's gone. 
Then the other thing I talked about, I said unemployment rate is important to uh, to 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 the Federal Reserve, right? And when I was going to school, again, we had this. Uh, there's this thing called the natural rate hypothesis, which basically said that at any point in time, there's going to be a certain level of unemployment due to frictions in the marketplace, the the length of time it takes people to get jobs, and that natural rate was about five percent, four and a half to five percent. And the most recent unemployment number that's come out for July, uh, unemployment was 4.3%. So if you subscribe to that natural rate hypothesis from years ago, we're actually still below that natural rate. 4.3% is obviously higher than the 3.1 or 2% that we saw several months ago. But you look this, this unemployment uh, rate chart going back to about 1980 shows you what high unemployment really looks like. And 10 Seven and a half, ten percent. Of course, this big spike on the on the right side of around 2020 was the pandemic. So maybe don't put focus on that one so much. But what a recession packed unemployment rate really looks like. This chart does a good job of illustrating that, for instance, the financial crisis that wasn't all that long ago, 2008, 9, 10, that unemployment rate edged all the way up to 10 percent. We are a long ways from that right now. Thank, thankfully, we are. And so Concerns about unemployment at, at this time seem a, a bit premature uh, from what, I've, what, what I'm seeing, uh, as well as the fact that the number of unemployed people per job opening is still less than one, which essentially implies that there are still more job openings. That, so I'm, I apologize for the scale at the bottom. I keep saying June, 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 but they're just annual numbers. But this 0.8 in June of, of 2024 essentially suggests that for every uh, job opening, there are 0.8 unemployed people or less than one. So in other words, if all the unemployed people suddenly took up all the available jobs or took took on, uh, uh, filled in and had an available job, there would still be open jobs left. All right. And typically when you're in a, recess, a recession period, that number might be one, two, or three, or four, where you're saying there's four unemployed, unemployed people per job opening. And right now, uh, we're still looking at a pretty tight uh, tight supply on the, on the labor market. The other thing that, like I said, that, that, that gets looked at is the uh, real GDP growth, okay, per quarter. And 20, uh, quarter three of 2020, kind of throw that one out simply because that was the quarter post pandemic you shut down most of the economy then you reopen it obviously you're going to have a massive growth but it's you know short lived it's been more and we go back to since 2022 gdp growth has been between 1 and a half to 2 2 and a half percent and as of the most recent quarter that we've concluded that's continued to be the case you know 2 2 and a half percent gdp growth uh, that's considered fairly healthy and robust so there's really nothing in the in the in the tea leaves of growth or slow a slowdown that 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 you would look at and say hmm yeah that's a that's a big red flag or a warning sign right there uh, it 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 just isn't isn't happening yet and so then one of the things that I find fairly interesting is looking at uh, what the market thinks the Federal Reserve is going to do and you can go on to the CME website and do federal funds rate monitor or whatever the, the search is. And you can come up with these charts. And so the market thinks that there's zero chance that the Federal Reserve holds rates where they are. But that's not new because every just about every single time the Fed has had a major meeting, uh, the market has basically thought that they were going to reduce rates. I, I've been looking at this chart now for two years and the quarter comes and the quarter goes and the market all thinks they're going to cut rates. And then when we get up to that, this is the uh, this meeting will be held on the 18th and, and, it, and then some new data comes out. And all of a sudden, them not reducing rates gets on the board and then it becomes a certainty. But right now, it's not surprising that most market participants think there will be a rate cut because, again, for the last two years, I've been looking at this. That's what they always think. So. It's hard to glean anything from this and, and uh, other than the fact that this is what they're hoping. I think this is in some ways a little bit more hope than, than actual expectation uh, on what's going to happen. So my general takeaway from everything that I've seen it, uh, or uh, read and researched on this topic is 
I think that it's going to be, there's no, there's really nothing certain about what the Fed is going to do in, in September or, or, or down the road. It's going to really depend on, are these inflationary numbers continuing to tick down? Uh, is there going to be a spike in unemployment? It's going to have to be more than 4.3%. Uh, and are, is this uh, tightness in the labor market going to, going to, you know, continue to, I guess water find its level for lack of a better word and the the number of job seekers and open jobs kind of settle out to where we uh, aren't to the point where we have more jobs than than actual workers and i'm not sure that september you know in a month that all of that is going to shake out and that the fed is going to be comfortable cutting rates in september i just don't and and the big concern i have right now based on this information and everything I've seen, it's not that I'm not concerned about recessions, I am, but based on the data that we have and where things sit, I would be more concerned about inflation surging back up if rate cuts are too swift and, and too severe than I am about a pending recession in the next quarter or two. That, that That's kind of because the, the, that actually happened in the 1970s when there was inflationary period in the early to mid 70s, the Federal Reserve raised the federal funds rate, which increased the interest rate. The uh, inflation came down. Then the Federal Reserve cut rates, uh, hindsight too soon. And then inflation surged way back up into the mid 80s to the point that rates had to go up two or three times higher than they were in the 70s. Because now you had this this big rebound in inflation, and the Fed had to go to extremes to get out ahead of it. That is a that is a pretty uh, scary scenario, and and something that that if that happens, then then the likelihood of a recession coming is is all but a certainty uh, under that scenario. Now I want to shift gears real quick and talk about uh, something that's coming uh, that I'm going to dive into a little bit more in the. In the September outlook and talking about this fall, and that is our projected net farm incomes for 2024. And I've run some pre preliminary numbers with what cash prices for corn, you know, uh, uh, new crop cash prices as well as old, but new crop cash prices for corn, soybeans, and spring wheat across the state. And it's it's not looking based on our projected crop budgets. It's not looking great. I you know with some of these cash bids for corn being three dollars and twenty cents, and even even lower, closer to three dollars out west, and hard red spring wheat bids being maybe five dollars, five fifteen in the east, and all the way down to five dollars in the west. Our our projected crop budgets for twenty four show that being a, a significant negative uh, net return per acre on those crops, and soybeans right now is 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 slightly above water, you know, in, in the black, but some preliminary uh, adjustments to the prices. And right now, I, I last I saw cash bids close to eight, eight ninety, eight, eight ninety five, some over nine bucks. Um, that break even price being closer to eight fifty, uh, that that's that's a challenge as well. And and the other thing, and it's been discussed before, and when we look at these net income numbers that there's a chance that USDA is going to have to revise the 2023 net farm income down because so much old crop was not priced and sold as much as they had estimated it would be because a lot of that information is based on a sampling. So it may be the case that 2023 is actually worse than we thought it was. And then 2024 is going to be significantly worse than that, uh, given where commodity prices are. It remains to be seen what yields are going to be, but you know, we're hearing some reports of low potential low test weight corn and some quality issues in, in wheat as well. And so uh, we'll see how that how that looks in the coming uh, coming months during harvest. But the, but the outlook isn't isn't all that rosy as far as that goes. So with that, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we'll, we'll do questions and answer at the end. And I believe uh, Tim is the next speaker coming on typically. Frayne follows me, but he is out of town. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, NDSU Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, let me see. I think maybe I need to switch this setting. There. Uh, first of all, uh, I've been visiting with Frayne 
and he wanted to uh, express his disappointment not being able to be with you. But Brain right now is presenting the Wheat Outlook at a meeting at Purdue University to many other uh, crop economists around the country. And, uh, and I was just visiting him with last night. And so, uh, you know, he sends his apologies and we'll be with you next time. So we're going to do the uh, Livestock Outlook and and uh, again, see if there are any questions at the end. So the big news in the cattle sector this month, obviously, has been the meltdown in the futures market. On the top is August live cattle. And that first week, you know, after the market has been in a general uptrend uh, since April, you know, with some a little bit of, of profit taking and setbacks. Uh, and that did occur there. Uh, you know, at the, at the uh, uh, end of July, July 26th, we were at the, at the high, at the contract high there and backed off a little bit there in the, that last week in July, which would be, uh, again, kind of normal profit taking. Then August hit, August 1st, and it just had a big meltdown uh, that week. And, and uh, then on feeder cattle it, it, on the bottom, and uh, in terms of the, the amount that went down, even went down more. So I'll come, I'll come back to these charts in a minute. But the, the main reason for that meltdown, uh, well, there were a lot of things, and, and Brian has kind of mentioned some of those, but, you know, the, the uh, concerns about the economy was a, a big thing. And you know, we always were still having the Middle East war thing. And then uh, President Biden had just uh, uh, said that he wasn't running for re-election and the market doesn't like an uncertainty. So we had that all going on. But the big thing that happened is on the top, the Japanese stock exchange there on August 1st just started falling dramatically. And uh, that caused world concern that maybe we were going to a world a recession and so we go to the bottom chart is the Dow in the US and uh, go up from uh, August 1st there then the same thing they the uh, uh, investors in the US started bailing out of the stock market and uh, because of, of concerns and started with the Japanese and so going on down and but you know the big thing here that we I think need to keep in perspective now is that on the top the Japanese market has uh, you know improved came back up on the bottom the Dow uh, uh, trading over uh, 40,000 there uh, uh, there this morning at 947, 40,421. And I think it was even higher than that here a little while ago. So there's been a rebound there. So, you know, uh, as Brian said, there were, you know, there is concerns about the economy, but things are, there, there, there are also positive factors. And I'll get more into that when I talk about beef demand, but going back to these charts then, uh, yeah, the, the, the futures, that, and these are the nearby, both of these contracts mature, uh, here at the end of the month, uh, next Thursday, the, the, well, the last Thursday of the month is when the feeder cattle close, and then the last uh, day is when the August uh, live cattle close. But anyway, one of the things that I that people have been asking me is, yeah, the, you know, the the feeder cattle are dependent on live cattle. Uh, feeder cattle prices, particularly in those distant uh, futures months when they when they will come out. But you know, uh, and we'll I, I'm also going to show you corn and feeder cattle in a little while too. That uh, actually is positive for feeder. Why did feeder cattle futures fall more than live cattle futures? And there's a good reason for that. What happened here then is the traders were bailing out of the stock market. So, uh, uh, you know, speculators, the funds had been long in the cattle market for a long time. And again, they were taking a little profits on, there on the live cattle at the end of July. And then the J Japanese thing hit. And so they continued, they bailed. The reason why the feeder cattle went down more than the live cattle is because the feeder cattle are a very thinly traded market. There's only about in all the 
all the contracts starting uh, here with, you know, August open interest is declining because it's about done. But you go on the, the, all the those fall contracts and uh, September, October, November, and then in the next year. And we'll look at those futures prices in a minute. All those contracts together, there's, uh, I think, less than 50,000 open contracts compared to the live cattle. There are about 275,000 open contracts and compare that to corn where there's about a million and a half or more open contracts when you only have a, a lightly traded market there and 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 the funds start bailing it impacts it a lot more so yeah the market did go down that week the good news again is when you look at the market it is rebounding some it hasn't it isn't back to where we left off but it is rebounding for some very good reasons and and uh, the main thing there is that the cash market is holding and and we'll look at that in a minute as well and and the fundamentals uh, have not changed that much that the future Futures market might indicate we've got short supplies of cattle. Again, the, the coward has went down five years as of last January 1st and it'll likely go down again this year. And so we're uh, sh uh, short of cattle. And so uh, here's the fed cattle uh, chart that I show you every month. And as you can see there, the red line on the top, uh, we're still at record high levels. Um, the all-time record high was just earlier the first week in July at 197 and last week we were down there about 192 and so we're off a little bit but still above last year and and still very strong we'll talk about demand here in a minute but demand is is holding and then you know the futures now have went down so they say that there is going to be uh, some continued weakness till the end of the year and but I think you know we're strongly supported at and by the end of the year even the future is seeing where they were last year so we have strong support there but looking at next year those gold squares there uh, again the futures market has fallen off quite a bit and uh, more, I think, than it should have. And I think we'll do better on fed cattle. And uh, and uh, beef production is going to be down next year. And and again, there you know there are questions on demand, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Actually, in the last WASDE report that just came out at the end of last week, USDA is usually quite conservative in estimating prices. And they're estimating the average price for next year at 190. So go on the left-hand side, go between 180 and 200. They're at 190 across. That's quite a bit above where the futures are indicating. And, you know, I would agree with USDA. And if all things come together, well, we could do even better than that. So uh, fed cattle prices are supported. They're at record high levels. And that will help out uh, feeder cattle as well so let's talk a little bit about beef demand and you know uh, uh brian mentioned some of those macroeconomic factors and stuff but beef demand is holding very very well better than some people thought a good indicator of beef demand is to look at the beef cutout value because that's what the packers can sell meat for into the uh, wholesale retail sector be it the domestic or the the uh, the export market. So worries about beef demand as of and that was one of the worries that the supposedly the futures market traders had as the stock market is crashing, all that 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 uh, beef demand would go down. That you know it's relatively high priced a protein source. And as of now, at least those worries are unfounded. You see the cutout value there is. Uh, is record high, higher than it was uh, last year. And just this morning when the when the report came out, the beef cutout value is up about two dollars today over yesterday, up around 317. So that means beef is moving and and the you know, yeah, the beef production is down a little bit. Uh, and but not as much as we earlier thought because of of uh, uh, feedlots keeping cattle longer and heavy uh, carcass weights and more heifers on feed and than we thought and all those indicators so we were moving a good volume at at very good prices so uh, demand is is uh, holding uh, quite 
well there and that's funneling down to the cash market and that's holding the cash market so uh you know we certainly hope that continues again there you know uh you know there's high credit card debt and we've got problems in the middle east and and so on and so on and so on but at, at least uh, as of now beef demand is holding and then when we look at the export side uh on the top are the, the actual volumes of exports and uh the black line there is uh, this year compared to the red line is last year. And then the five-year average is the dash blue line. But we're, you know, just off a little bit, even on volume where we were last year. Uh, we knew there'd be headwinds on exports because one, we're producing less. And two, there's record high prices. And so that's, you know, always a, a, a headwind for exports. So beef exports uh, and, and there's been some consternation of people talking about the market. Well, exports are off. So, you know, that could negatively impact the market. But a better uh, uh, measure of, of exports and how that might affect cash prices is on the bottom is the actual export value. And so when you go to the value down there, you see that black line is actually above last year's red line. So we are selling more dollars worth of beef than we did last year to funnel down uh, through the system and ultimately get to cow calf producers. Now it is off to 2022 was our a record high there. We had high volumes and, and, and higher prices too. But you know, year over year, we're doing fine there. And uh, even up on the volume side, likely uh, we're always two months behind in getting information, but we're probably going to be above on the volume uh, by the time the, the July numbers come up. So both domestic demand and export demand are holding in there. Uh, fed cattle prices are <clears throat> at record high levels. and and um, But it's the futures market, of course, that got upset and, 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 uh, and, and even that's kind of coming back now. Last time I talked to you about this seasonal index for feeder steers, so I don't want to go through the whole thing again like I did last time, but again, usually this time of the year we peak out and, and prices do go down, and this year uh, the seasonal peak is uh, is going to be earlier, it Was it's you know already in there in uh, in june and and uh, and has came down and uh and, and some of that yes was those distant fed cattle futures that are now lower and that's what feedlots can hedge into but there's uh other things going on there too uh you know one thing we, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier but uh uh, feedlots are keeping cattle longer, uh, feed prices are low, and uh, and uh, packers are encouraging them to keep them longer to help keep beef production up so they have more to sell because there's demand for it. So that, you know, that demand for feeder cattle is is a, a little bit less because they're just keeping cattle longer. And one of the reasons they're keeping longer is because they're still very high priced. And then, uh Grazing conditions have been the best this year uh, in in cattle grazing, summer grazing country that they've been all the way from Texas on up through North Dakota than they've been for a few years. And so, the, you know, uh, the, the ones that there aren't many selling, and so the ones that are selling in many cases would be the uh, lower quality and so on. So I think that's that's in, in, into those prices have funneled in again. And so we really haven't uh, tested them very much and, and that'll be coming up here. There are some special yearling sales coming up here in North Dakota here in the next couple of weeks. And, and, and that'll be a, 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 a good test. But, you know, I think again with fed cattle holding and we'll look at corn in a minute, you know, there's support there at least uh, by the well by the end of the year where they went down last year above that the futures market there is saying that you know near last year's prices and then even for next year those gold squares there they've really taken them down and one time just a few months ago they were up there at 270 but again uh, all the all the uncertainty and so on and the, and they got the futures traders scared and so they've brought that market down but i'm think that you know based on our lower supplies and and all the you know corn prices are a big thing too but you know usda and the wasdi expecting a, a big corn crop this year 
And so that would be supportive and, and we could do better than what those futures are saying and up even above uh, where they were last year. So uh, this chart then, I just looked at the September feeder cattle contract and corn contract and uh, just go back here to the beginning. I was going to mention that, but I forgot to. You see, the since April, the Fed live cattle futures just continued up, up, up until they just peaked out there in July 26. But the feeder cattle uh, kind of did not continue to go up, got up there, you know, up into May. And then they held kind of uh, of steady rather than going up uh, live cattle did. And the reason for that is because as you see in this chart, the green line then is corn futures, September corn futures were relatively high there during the early summer into May, June and so on with wondering if the corn was gonna get in and how much and what yields might be and so on. But again, corn prices have came off uh, dramatically corn September corn futures from up there you know at 480 down Brian just mentioned you know uh, you know there's the the futures at 370 but you take the basis off in North Dakota what it is that he just mentioned so so corn prices are low usually we have that opposite relationship but you know since August you know when all pandemonium broke loose in the in the feeder cattle futures kind of throw out that opposite relation with corn but now you see you know again the futures have came back up and as corn has went down there recently and so uh you know as uh we don't know what the corn crop is it's still quite a ways from being in the bin and so on but that's supportive to uh very supportive to feeder cattle prices as there's lower corn prices not good for corn producers as brian said but on the on the cattle side supportive to feeder cattle so here's the 550 to six weight steer calves and again not many selling yet good conditions throughout the the country and uh and uh but again we've we've put in our seasonal peak uh, on on calf prices and usually they are the lowest right there in october and so you know that would tell us if history repeats itself that uh, you know that we will see some more weakness there, but still supported above last year, and uh, by uh, by several dollars record high values there. Even though you know the, everybody looks back to midsummer and say, well, why is it when we when supplies are the lowest they've been for a long time? Why is the market going down? But you know, it's a seasonal thing. And when the big runs hit the market and, and so on uh, here in the fall, then, uh, you know, that uh, that uh, does affect the market. And we have that that seasonal low occurring. So that's uh, likely going to happen again. But the good news is that, we, you know, we will do better uh, likely on prices than we did last year. So I haven't talked about lamb prices for a little while, and now we're starting to ratchet up uh, lamb marketing here in the fall. So just wanted to show you that the chart is fed lamb prices in the Northern Plains market here, uh, you know, where we have reports. And yeah, again, we have uh, came down from the, you know, that big spike that we had in, in lamb there and in, in the, for the the holidays, the spring holidays, it was a really, really good demand. And we're short supply on lambs. The the sheep flock continues to decline a little bit. And, but, uh, you know, in there, they're selling lamb, fed lambs there for about 187 now is a little bit lower than they were uh, last year. Uh, here's a Bowman sale from a week ago, Monday on feeder lambs. Feeder lambs are actually selling for more than they did uh, last year at this time, be, mainly because of lower corn prices. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, shows you the weight of lambs there and those 70 to 80, 90 pound lambs in there, a lot of them around 200 up to, you know, kind of a high of 220 or whatever. And, and there are markets, I think, tomorrow Kist is having a lamb sale and then next Monday Bowman is having another sale and, and so on. So again, the lambs are hitting the market, but, but uh, pretty well received there by buyers, particularly with the core, lower corn. So with that, uh, I'm going to quit and uh, Dave and Brian and see if there might be any questions. Great. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I, uh, I had a question that I said I'd answer at the end there, Dave, but I kind of want to do it with a uh, screen share again that I pulled okay. up. Okay, 
Let me see. Did I stop? Oh, yeah, I, I stopped, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here, I'm going to do this real quick. So the question was, have a... Uh, uh, has inflation been abnormally low for the last 18 to 20 years? Okay. And so here's a chart from the uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve tracking the yearly inflation rate. And so <clears throat> prior to the most recent uh, high inflationary period that we're still trying to come out of, if you look back from about 2020 all the way to, I would say, about if you look here, 1986, the Federal Reserve really did keep that inflationary rate down to about two to two and a half percent. Uh, you see the big dip here. This was a disinflationary period in 2009. That was coming off the Great Recession. Uh, and then we have a period of low and uh, lower inflation for about six years or so, but, I, you know, not by historical standards, super low. So, you know, and then I come back here. And when we talk about the 80s, just to put into perspective how high inflation was in 1980, uh, the inflation rate was 13 and a half percent, which was the highest ever. Prior to that, it was 11, 11 percent and 74. And then the most recent spike was about eight, just, just slightly over eight percent. So I guess to answer that question, no, I wouldn't say it was, you know, historically low. I guess you could say that that period from, you know, 13, let's let's call it 12 to 12 to 17 was on, on the lower end of things. But there had been some periods like even in the 60s where, where inflation was that low for that long a time. And the other thing I want to show real quick, and I mentioned it, but I didn't uh, elaborate a ton on it, was that period in the 70s when the Federal Reserve lowered the federal funds rate and inflation spiked. So you come back here, the red line is the effective federal funds rate in this chart, and the blue line is the inflation rate. So if you look at the period right before 1970, there was a spike inflation, the blue line, and the Federal Federal Reserve increased the federal funds rate. Inflation went down, the Federal Reserve de, uh, decreased interest rates. Then inflation spiked back up again. So the Federal Reserve had to increase rates here in the mid-70s, all the way up to almost 12, 11, 12 percent. That got out in front of it. Inflation came down then in the late 70s. But then inflation spiked back up in the 80s, and all of a sudden the federal funds rate was all the way up to, in some cases, 15, 16, and even closer to 20% during certain periods of time. Uh, like, you know, January of 1981, the federal funds rate was 19%. Okay. So the point is, we have this cycle here where inflation dropped because of the higher rates, the fe uh, uh, higher rates, rates were cut, then inflation surged back up. Then they increased rates until finally in the 80s, it got to a point where they just raised them, kept them elevated for many years to get inflation back down, and then were able to taper off those rates. That's the concern that I, I kind of have a little bit with, with this clamoring for lower rates, lower rates when, when the economy isn't actually in a bad spot, is this, this period that you look back to historically, the late, late 60s to the mid 80s, where we have had this repetitive cycle of increased rates to get in front of inflation, inflation's come down, we decrease rates, then inflation surges again. And that that cycle happened three straight times. And the final one was pretty painful for those of you who actually lived in them and, and tried to conduct business in the mid 80s. So I'll stop sharing. But to answer. OK, the question, yeah. yes, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, finish up and then because i've well, got a question yeah 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 i see it so so to answer the question no i wouldn't say it's been abnormally low prior to this run-up i mean there's examples and periods where it, it was on the low side but it wasn't like interest rates have been had been prior to this where they were historically low for a long period of time with no real cycle into it it was just that that's different than what had happened with inflation, just kind of ebbing and flowing a little bit below that two percent mark for for a period of time. So I hope that answered your question. With that, all uh, Tim has a question. Okay, um, I have a question. When do uh, uh, I think the cowherd rebuilding or restocking, you might call it, because you know that's basically what it is, because the drought uh, will start in earnest. And the answer to that is, it's not going to start very soon. It's going to be very slow. Uh, uh, I've written some articles on that, that that 
But one of the things is back in 2014, we did into 2015 and so on was a rapid after the previous record high prices, we were increased the, the beef cow herd quite rapidly. But back then we had a lot more replacement heifers on hand to go on. And this time we do not have replacement heifers. And there's a lot of concern. There's, there's a concern about how fast uh, the prices did decline in the, a, after 2014-15 at the end of 2015 into 16. Uh, interest rates are higher uh, than they have been and uh, and there's there still is although drought has improved significantly uh, there still is some concern about that so uh, we just don't have the replacement efforts. Now I fully expect this fall for at least on a U.S. basis. And again, there's regional differences where there's dry and it won't happen. But I expect more replay, more heifers to re, be uh, retained from this fall's calf crop. Uh, again, it kind of depends on weather and so on. But with record high prices, you would certainly expect that. But, uh, you know, a heifer calf held back this fall that we hope gets bred next summer and hope has a calf the next year, it's going to be a, a, a slow, slow process. And so uh, herd rebuilding, uh, you know, unfortunately we didn't get a July cattle on cattle report like we usually do because uh, NAS ran out of money. And so we won't know till January 1st, but it, it'll probably show some more heifers than last year retained, but you know, there'll be very little, uh, the calf crop next year is going to be lower again and uh, very slow, I guess. And so I think we would, we're going to have to wait a, into 2026 before we would be able to do any. And again, the weather and a lot of other things. So to answer your question, it's, it's going to be a lot slower uh, buildup than uh, we usually previously have seen. Great, thanks, Tim. Brian, I actually have a question for you, or if you can uh, give a little bit of thought into uh, what might happen if we do see a reduction in rates. You know, what might that mean to producers going into next year, to lenders going into next year? And so, if you want to pick pick a rate cut by January, and where that might put uh, the production side of things. Well, I think that it would be it would be some it would be certainly a relief to a lot of our producers across the state to see a rate cut and and actually a relief to the to the lenders of those producers because with if everything just kind of continues with the way it's gone in agriculture in terms of commodity prices where they're at i think there's going to be a lot more back up we've we've definitely chewed through a lot of the working capital that we built up in 22 and 21 for the most part right and we saw when we looked at uh, the data out of like the KC Fed and Minneapolis Fed that <laughs> loan demand had actually been declining because, you know, we had all this working capital. Well, so then you couple that with higher rates. Well, that's, you know, that softens that higher rate period when you're borrowing less money, right? Because you don't have to pay as much in interest. Well, with 23 being as tough as as tough as we think it was and 24 being even even worse. And right now, you know, it's it's hard to say what 25 is going to look like, but there really isn't anything on the horizon at this moment that would suggest that we're going to see this big rebound in commodity prices. And, you know, having talked to Frayne about this, the long run horizon on it isn't isn't terribly rosy. There's going to be a lot more borrowing on operating lines and everything else going into it, especially next spring. So a rate cut uh, between like you, you asked now in December, let's say, and I personally just on that note, believe December is the more likely scenario than September. I could be wrong, but I wouldn't be shocked at all if there was one in the, De in the December timeframe. Uh, you know, that's going to be a pretty welcome site. I would think that it, that it's going to help, mitigate some of that additional borrowing you know if you can knock one or two percentage interest rate off uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be significant for anyone buying new equipment anyone financing operating loans and everything else uh, so it, it'll help 
but it's certainly not going to offset the fact that commodity prices right now are just so, so low relative to our production costs. And then I just got another question. Do I, see, oh, here we go. Did I answer your question, by the way, Dave? You did. Thank you. Yeah. Do I see input costs coming down for 2025 seed, fertilizer, <laughs> and chemical? Oh, <laughs> well, um, short answer, no, but I'll explain. Fertilizer prices uh, have come down, and I, I'm not going to say just a flat out no, but not enough that it's going to be a major factor in reducing our production costs. So fertilizer prices have come down since well off the peaks from a, from a year and a half ago. Nitrogen prices have kind of ebbed, ebbed downward, but I think we're going to have to do, uh, there's this phrase we use in economics called your anchoring point. And that's guess essentially your frame of reference that you're using to say these qualitative statements like low price versus high price, what's your anchoring point? Well, we saw really low fertilizer prices in like 2017. We saw nitrogen prices, uh, his, you know, very, very low, even inflation adjusted very, very low. Since then, though, things have changed. Supply chains have done some adjusting. And right now, I would say that, like, for instance, nitrogen prices don't have a whole lot more downward movement. I mean, they're below the five-year average right now as it sits in, in some cases, and they may slide even further, but we're talking about percentage points, not a massive cut of like 30% and 50. Then the other fertilizer issue, and that's on the phosphorus side, is what's going on with the tariffs uh, that, that for, for imported phosphorus from countries like Morocco and Russia, where those tariffs were slapped on uh, several months ago, like 18 months ago, and the tariff went up to like 18% on phosphorus. So when you go back and look at phosphorus prices, it has never, it has not come down to its pre-pandemic levels. And it's hard to imagine that it ever will if, with that tariff in place, right? Because that, that it, in a lot of ways, that puts a price floor in there that didn't exist before. So we've got to revise uh, what our baseline expectation is for that. And then seed and chemical costs, seed costs, I haven't seen a lot of instances historically where seed costs have come down, um, especially given that folks use the kind of uh, weed management systems that are prescribed by the seed that they use and the chemicals that are associated with that. I mean, you do see some reduction in costs if, if you're buying generics or something like that. Those can those can be, but, but we've basically priced a lot of that in and it has come off of the uh, highs from from years ago, but no, I don't see not a major, major reduction in those. If, if it is, it's going to be on the margin. We're going to talk for percentage points, not double digits or anything like that for those, those specific production costs. The one area that you didn't mention, uh, used equipment prices continue to soften. So that's something I've been watching. And I talked about this morning with a, a news outlet, um, was that we're, we're still seeing used equipment prices soften, which I thought was a little bit surprising because you the, the, typically those used equipment prices do a fairly quick correction and then kind of level out, but they've actually continued to move move downward even further. So I don't know when, when the end in sight for that is, but uh, it bears watching if you know folks or you yourself are in, in kind of the equipment market. Maybe you typically don't look at the used equipment market to do any of your replacing or whatever, this might be the time to maybe rethink that, especially given where margins are sitting right now. And I'll throw in a follow-up. Uh, land rental prices, you didn't think that, I mean, it's in the next six months, it's just too short of a time span to really see much. I mean, obviously rents will be revisited looking into 2025. Yeah, the rent... The land rental dynamic has had me scratching my head for years now, a few years. And I mean, we've had these massive increases in land prices and values at, you know, 10%, 12%, 14% in some areas and rental rates edging up more like three, four, five, and 6%. And it, it, it we had one I mean, there was a lot of cash out there, but we had a couple of strong net farm income years that just, Drove land prices berserk, and so now we're going into twenty twenty and ending out twenty twenty four, headed into twenty five. And I've said 
if if rental rates don't continue to increase, that gap between what rental rates are and land prices are just continues to not make any sense. I mean, it just it just absolutely doesn't to be paying seventy five hundred dollars an acre, eighty five hundred dollars an acre in North Dakota. And I know you guys have heard the anecdotes of, you know, the potato one. I think that was like nineteen thousand dollars. But put that one aside. You know, seventy five hundred, eighty five hundred dollars an acre, but only paying two hundred dollars an acre in rent. I mean, that square in that circle is awful tough. And then you, then we have a situation like we're in now, and it's hard to find another 50 bucks an acre to pay in rent. As I just out of the other side of my mouth said that, corn, you know, we're going to lose money on corn, wheat, and soybeans. But I will say, I mean, land prices are not going to come down until they absolutely have to. Nobody's going to sell at a discount until they're almost forced to. And I think part of it, part of what's going to, determine some of that is how the safety nets wind up working in the next in the coming years that are put there that 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 may support and, and kind of prevent that uh, that big drop in land prices rents i would have said six months ago i thought they were going to go up again probably four or five six percent but now yeah i i don't know how that negotiation is going to look when you have a tenant who just lost money on through two out of three of our major crops and then you're asking for a rental rate increase i'm, I'm not sure how how that would go but it seems less likely now than it did six months ago thanks rob i don't see any more questions uh we will be back next month uh september 12th uh I, i'd assume that'll include the full docket with frame returning uh until then i hope you have a great rest of the summer and we'll see you in september mm -hmm.